What's up, Dream Media family? This is Zach. Welcome back to another episode. Today, I'm going to be having on a live stream with our good friend Shane Lee, one of our favorite manufacturers, Screen Innovations. In the home theater world, there's only a few good quality screen manufacturers and Screen Innovations, a Texas-based company, has been one of my favorites for years. Today, we are gonna be premiering and educating you guys on their newest addition. They have created a new Mistro. This is their Generation 2 acoustically transparent screen. This does come in a wide variety of options. You have their zero edge frame, which is like that TV-like look, um, but also um, they have the traditional home theater thicker frame, which is going to be going into Shane Lee's new home theater. Um, the real draw to these screens is you can do a baffle wall and you can hide all of your equipment at your height right behind the screen to where you don't see any speakers and you get great audio performance. I was told that these screens are gonna have less than a 2 dB impact on your audio performance, which is honestly better than a lot of speaker grills. So I could not be more honored to offer this product to you guys and bring Ryan and Blake from SI onto Shane Lee's channel so that we can take a deep dive into this new technology and make sure that we educate you guys. That's what we do here at Dream Media is we make a variety of content, inspirational whole home, like walkthrough projects where we show off work that's already been completed, unboxing videos, checking new stuff out, in addition to these educational live streams. Um, there's a lot of products to choose from and here at Dream Media, we like to make the selection easy by delivering this educational content. We're nationwide and would love the opportunity to earn your business. All right, guys, I can't wait to get into this live stream. Let's go. Hey guys, this is Gene from Audioholics and I'm happy to be working with Dream Media. Dream Media is a home cinema and audio company that I highly recommend and I'm proud to have as an official channel sponsor. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Home Theater Hangout on Thursday with myself. And I got a full crew today. I've got Zach and Kellen from Dream Media. And I've got Blake from Screen Innovations. Today, we are going to be discussing a couple of screen options. As you guys know, I'm rebuilding my home theater and I need a new screen. So we've reached out to Screen Innovations because they have some of the best screens in the business. Or so I heard. I'm going to find out soon enough. Um, we're going to talk about the Leonard Bernstein of screens, the maestro from Screen Innovations. Blake, what's so good about this screen that we're going to be talking about today? And and also, let's get into, um, let's help some people about, on how to pick a perfect screen for their room. Sure. Well, thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it because, there, you know, a lot of people think about their projector, projector, projector. They forget that no one ever sits in a movie theater, sits down and turns around and watches the projector right? We watch the screen. Everybody watches the screen. In fact, I like to joke that the screen is absolutely the most important part of the entire movie industry because it's the only part that the paying public actually, actually interfaces with. <laughs> Think about that. So yeah. the screen is obviously very, very important to the two-piece projection system, and it's often overlooked. So what we're doing is here in the Thunderdome here at Screen Innovations Galactic Headquarters, we can talk about how there's not a silver bullet. Right. There's never just one screen that is going to be the right screen for everybody. Like, for instance, in your case, we're doing a dedicated darkroom cinema, correct? That's right. So we're not worried about turning the lights on. You're doing a lot of uh, testing. You're looking for that perfect darkroom image. Well, then we look at something like behind me, which is our white maestro material, which was, again, never design designed to work with the lights on. It's an acoustically transparent material, so we can play place the speakers directly behind it. But again, for dark room settings only. Versus to my right, we've got our carbon black, which you can notice immediately is black. It also comes in acoustically transparent, but it's designed to work with the lights on and off. So imagine trying to do a bright room setting with a projector and a white screen. How do you project white onto a black surface using a light bulb in a bright right. room? 
right? So you don't do that. So that's yeah. why we have lots of different screen materials here at Screen Innovations is in order to get you the right product for the right job, right? So going back over here to Maestro, this is my favorite. Now, I want, to, I want to clarify this real quick. I am selling video products, right? I've been selling video products for like 20 years. I am a true audiophile at heart. I only sell video products so I can supplement my audio in, uh, habit. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I love this material. If you're doing a dedicated darkroom cinema and you're using speakers from like Wilson or Meyer or Elf Acoustic or uh, BMW Nautilus, you know, a really, really true high-end speaker, um, then you want to look at a woven screen material. And the reason for that and the reason for uh, Maestro is, for instance, Maestro has less than a 3 dB gain in any peaks and valleys of the, of, when you're passing the sound through it, you're going to have a less than a 3 dB spike, uh, which means we as humans hear in increments of 3 dB. So in other words, the difference that this sound makes, the screen makes to your sound passing through it is unaudible to humans. Your golden retriever might go, did I just hear something go through the screen? Right? But not you, right? Correct. So this is, a, in fact, we had this material tested with our good friends in Paradigm in their antidote chamber up in Canada, and it actually tested better than many of their spe speaker grill cloths. So when it comes to the acoustically transparentness of an acoustic transparent screen, say that three times fast, it's hard to beat Maestro 2. Now, the reason we're calling it Maestro 2 is because Maestro 1, here we go, was a little different. See how good our camera is here. This is the original Maestro. You can probably see there's a lot of texture to that woven material. You guys see that in the camera? Yeah. 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 Now, in a 1080p world, that's fine. And what's also cool about this material is if you can see, it's got a natural uh, woven angle at about a 20 degree angle. And what that does is it helps eliminate the problem of that's very common with acoustically transparent screens, which is called more A. And what's yep. happening with the more A pattern is the pixels are not aligning with the holes properly and you get this wavy effect, right? Well, by having that horizontal line built into it, believe it or not, that actually helps out a lot with avoiding the more A. In fact, I've only seen more A happen three times with our Maestro One material. And funny enough, it actually happened out at Adam Sandler's house um, when uh, they installed their theater there. And I, I didn't believe it. Yeah, I didn't believe it. So I actually flew out to see this project. And when I got there, that's what they told me. It was Adam Sandler's house. I'm like, super cool. And they go, yeah, you just missed Adam Sandler. And uh, a couple other famous people just walked out like 10 minutes ago. So anyway, <laughs> it's an easy fix. If you do ever run across the Mori pattern, it's an easy fix. All we do is we take the material out, we recut the material, and we bias it 20%. Right? We just turn the material 20%, recut it, send it out. So it's, a, it's an easy fix. You can also try pulling the projector back a little bit farther or pushing it forward a little bit. To change its uh, positioning, but again, if you ever run across more A, it's not the end of the world. We just shift the material twenty percent and recut it for you. So but, that uh, that material looks interesting. Most of the uh, weave screens that I've had here have been like spandex. That does yeah. not look like spandex. That would be PVC. Yeah, which we do have that. We do, uh, for instance, our slate uh, ambient light rejecting material, which we can microperf, is a PVC material. But the difference is with PVC materials or the spandexy looking stuff. Is that what you're referring to? Is the the ones with the micro purse? No, the, the actual stuff? like the actual like weave. The, it's uh, it's stretchy. Kind of pantyhose, kind of stretchy stuff. Yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. 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 So that's also pretty interesting. The the challenge to a really stretchy kind of material, if you're pushing your hand into it, it's giving a lot of give. Is it's difficult to predict the the opening patterns, right? So you again going back to Maestro One, you actually see the hole pattern here, right? You see where the holes, the gaps are. With Maestro 2, that's not the that's not the situation. We've got a nice, a tighter weave, but it actually goes, instead of a, a hole that goes directly through the screen, it actually goes at an angle, right? So it's actually yeah. almost like two pieces of material laid over each other with a slight shift, because as we know as audiophiles, sound doesn't exactly go like this. It does this, right? That's why we call them sound waves. And so when the sound hits the screen, Rather than trying to go through a, a linear hole, rather it goes like this, it's kind of like a paintbrush when it hits. Yeah. Right. And so we're actually with these angles we have available for the two pieces of material, uh, it's a better pass through. Better pass through. So we're also using a 1.1 gain, which is about as close to unity gain as you can get. Right. Um, and we've also made the material a little bit cooler. Uh, it's difficult to see it now. Yeah. Well, I've got the, oh, I can blank the projector out here. I'll show you. Here, you can see the original Maestro is just a shade warmer than the new Maestro, mm -hmm. right? 
So we're always doing things like this. We're always looking at our formulas, trying to make improvements to screen innovation. So this is our first true 4K woven material in white, and it is a and it is a, a true, true, true white. Wow, interesting. Okay, yeah. yeah most of the weave screen or the weave transparent screens I've had, they've, they've always been like a negative gain, like a negative seven or eight. So that's interesting that you, you guys are at a one point one. Yeah, this is what we're trying to do is is really not infringe at all on the image, right? What's projected yeah. at it is what we want to send back, right? And so it, obviously when you start looking at uh, darker materials, they're going to have an effect on the image. And that's okay if planned for, right? Yeah. If you're looking at a black diamond or a slate or, or a, a carbon black, obviously that was being black surfaces. You're going to have a different kind of adjustment. But when you like what you're doing is what we're looking for is almost like a DCI compliant theater, Right. And a DCI compliant theater is what our friends in uh, Southern California that are all in the movie industry, right? When they want to work from home, they have a system that is what's called DCI compliant, right? And that means it's meeting a, a maximum standard. It's a very, very, very high standard of performance because when they get those dailies, you know, uh, over and they, they want to watch content from something that was shot today, they need to know that the system they're watching it on is perfect, right? Yep. So that's another thing we look at is, is this screen material, DC, would it be DCI compliant? And the answer is absolutely yes. Nice. Yeah. So a, a nice, accurate picture is what Very we're accurate getting picture. in a, uh, obviously in a uh, light controlled room. Yes. That is a so, room for definitely light controlled room. Is this uh, is this screen like a, um, something that the customer put together themselves or does it come put together from the factory? No, this, we can do, you can build this on your floor in about half an hour. It's a very simple assembly. In fact, it doesn't, it's not even difficult for us to ship anymore. We're actually seaming the long spans of the frame. So the long span you see actually has a seam in it. And then we bring that together here. I'll unblink this so you can see some more light on the screen here, some images on the screen. We've actually made videos too, guys. If you go to Dream Media's channel, showing the installation of many of their screens and the scene that he's talking about is very simple. Uh, like he said, you can put these screens together, even with no experience mounted up to the wall and everything, realistically in about two hours, if it's your yeah. first time doing it. It's not a huge deal. And what's great with projector screens like this that are broke down for packaging is you can get them into rooms easily. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of spaces where you can't lug a hundred inch TV around tight corners and whatnot, you can easily get a nice big projector screen in there. Right on, right on. In fact, you don't see much of the frame because who really does, but this is the back of the frame for the zero edge and the two inch frame. And you see there's a lot of aluminum going on back here. Right. So it's a very solid construction. Right. And that's important. I mean, believe it or not, one of the harder things to do is to make a material hang flat in space. With yeah, I got to give it to you, Blake. Yeah. You guys, the build quality of your screens is second to none. I always point that out in our installation videos. Really, really solid. Now, you'll notice the interior gap here. The back of the screen is not black. It's actually still white, but we've added a piece of what we call black cheesecloth. It's also acoustically transparent, and that presses directly up against the material. Now, there's two reasons you do this. One is it's actually improving the contrast a little bit from the front because you're not losing quite as much light passing through the screen, and you're getting that black material a little bit of enhancement. You'll also, if you could put your fingers on this, guys, you'd feel that it's a very soft, open pattern. And so what we're trying to avoid is what's called coning. Coning is when you've got your driver, right, your speaker driver right here, and it's firing into the material and some of that sound, those sound waves are actually bouncing off the material and coming back to the speaker, bouncing off now the speaker cabinet and going back out through the screen. So we're trying to avoid that was ever possible because obviously that's, we're causing a, a, a phase issue with, when we have a coning problem. So what we've done is it breaks up the sound, allows it to pass through a little bit easier and doesn't reflect the sound back into the speaker and cause this coning issue. So that's again, two reasons why we have the black uh, material on the back of the screen. So how many, um, see, go ahead, guys. How many inches from the back of that screen no should inches the speaker at all. be? Oh, no? the speaker, yeah. The speaker, you know, this, is, this isn't a law. This is, I don't know if I've ever seen this written down. This is conversations that a bunch of us guys that have been around for a while kind of have. A good rule for anybody is per, per inch of driver, that's about as far back as you want to put the speaker, right? And never go above really an eight-inch driver when you go behind the speaker. When you start getting into subwoofer sizes, like 10-inch drivers, 12-inch drivers, 15-inch drivers, then you run the problem of seeing the actual compression wave hitting the back of the screen, right? So highs and mids, no problem. For every inch of driver, that's probably where you should be, right? 
And again, try to avoid pushing a six inch driver or an eight inch driver right up against the material because that's where you're going to run into coating issues. Right. Okay. So that's got a slight gain to it, a 0.1 gain to it. I would assume there's like zero hot spotting with that. Zero hot spotting on this material. Yeah. That's why we, we went closer to white, a true white. Uh, we had the, again, the Maestro one was a little bit warmer, but again, for you purists out there, which I, I point out a lot of people liked a lot of, uh, Folks that do set up their own things like that warmer type, but a lot of, of our professionals out there want that ISF 6,500 degree Kelvin, you know, response. So that's what we are as much as color accurate as we can be. And then with the, I'm sorry, and you mentioned before, uh, did you guys say something? I'm sorry. I thought I heard somebody say, oh, no. this guy just walked in. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> somebody in the back of the room just walked in. I thought that was you guys talking. All right. <laughs> Oh, here's a question for you, uh, Paul. Okay. Uh, question. I am building a home cinema room with no windows dedicated space. Do I really need ALR screen for my UST projector or would a regular screen material work well too? So for a UST projector, actually, that's a, that's a different conversation. You, you're using a specific type of material for ultra short throws. That is, that is a lenticular screen that's going to accept the light coming up and then push the light out. Okay, so again, you've got a light path that's coming literally from my feet up, and that screen is specifically designed to push that light coming in at such a, a, a very, very aggressive angle, and then push it out that direction. Okay, so in addition to that lenticular ability to push it that direction, you also have the contrast enhancement that our ST material has. Now, you can do a short throw projector and shoot it into a white material but a white material or a gray material is not designed to do this and then that. It's, to, it's gonna basically be like a right angle. It's gonna come up and push it up to the ceiling. Does that make sense? So a screen material that's specifically designed for ultra short throw is doing something that's very, very complicated. It's actually taking light, bringing it up at an aggressive angle and then turning it and pushing it straight into your eyes rather than like a white screen, which is accepting the, the, the light at this path and pushing it up to that path. So your ceiling is getting an amazing look. It's getting an amazing You also impact. potentially run yeah. the threat of hot spotting too. If your short yeah. throw is pretty powerful, if you have a, a non-negative gain screen, you can run into some hot spotting issues. I can't recommend this enough, guys. The Using uh, either our ST material, our screen innovations ST material, short throw ST, right? Or any short throw material. Not now. All short throw materials are not created equal. We're very proud of the material that we developed close to ten years ago in conjunction with Sony when they brought out the original GTZ one laser short throw projector. If you guys remember that video that we put out like close to ten years ago, it had like a million views. We built that material specifically for that first generation short throw projectors. Well, it turns out we did a really good job, and we've had a chance to actually do a side by side comparison of other ultra short throw materials. And as, as Zach mentioned, we've run into other materials that do hot spot. Also, yeah. when you're looking at lenticular screens, you're looking at blades. I mean, physical blades embedded onto the screen, and that's a big deal. So you want to get like a jeweler's lens out or get your camera lens, you know, very, very close to the screen material. And you're going to see in a lot of lenticular screens that the, the blades are not perfectly linear. They're doing this, right? They'll also have chips or gaps in the blades. We actually go so far as to actually do a coating on the underside of the blade so we don't reflect the light back down into the, into the projector. So... Not all ST materials, not all short throw materials are created equal, but I would definitely take any short throw designed material over a white or gray if I was doing a, a UST projector. Yeah, absolutely. Even yeah, even in a non-dedicated or dedicated room, for sure. It, definitely in a non-dedicated, even more so in a dedicated space because light scatter, all right? So again, if the screen is accepting the light and then pushing it to the viewer and not pushing it up to the ceiling, that means your room's darker. Right. Yeah. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to make this room as dark as possible. Well, if you put a shine a light bulb at a white surface, you just lit up the room. <laughs> right? Yeah. right. And you've seen that. If you've seen our ST material, if you let's pan over here, our ST material is nearly as black as. Oh, here it is right here. Oh, here we go. So here's ST. Right. What color do you guys see right now? Dark gray. Dark gray. Dark gray. Almost black. Right. All right. We'll check this out. Now, what color do you see? White. Yeah. White. See that? See how I just changed the pitch? The lenticular property. That's the lenticular. Now Now I've gone vertical. It's gone black. But if I go horizontal, I see white. That's what the projector is actually seeing. 
right, is a white surface. But when you go to lenticular, now we're blocking 90% of the light from above. This is super science, guys. This is like the pinnacle, the sharp edge of screen engineering right here. And so this is, this is why you should, and I mean always, use an ultra short throw material with an ultra short throw projector. I'll right. have to say, though, I mean, Lake's not just blowing smoke, guys. I did a video. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I did a video, you know, when Epson sent me over their LS800, which um, they they make a good screen too, but I, I was impressed with the image and then Screen Innovation sent me over the ST and it is literally night and day. Like that yes. video comparing, I think I did with the lights on, with the lights off and showing, you know, flashing back and forth between the two screens, but not to knock Epson because it's it's really honestly in a different class. I mean, sure. screen innovations is, is the pinnacle of high performance home theater screens. But in that video, you can see in a very clear way how powerful the appropriate screen really is because it made a, a very considerable notable difference. I mean, it was obvious on camera and even more so in person, which I shared my thoughts on it. Yeah, I'll point out that, you know, a lot of people don't think about it, but this is a true television alternative. Because remember, with a short throw projector and an ST screen, either at a fixed or motorized, now we have our lift, we can motorize it by lifting it up, and very soon we have a drop motorized version of ST coming. So think about this, rollable television, no glass or Lexan surface, so there's no glare. And with that deep, rich black of the material and a really good, like the Epson LS800, the new Samsungs are super cool, LG's got some nice stuff, and there's more stuff coming. I'm, I'm going to go up against OLED performance in a bright room. And because remember, I don't care how dark the room is or how bright the room is. If you're watching a TV, you're going to see glare. And with our materials, you don't. And one and thing I I on that too, guys, lights mm -hmm. on, lights off. And I talked about, I showed uh, shots of my living room TV. And that is one of the most difficult things to overcome with, you know, yes, they're coming out with more and more affordable, big TVs, but you can't, really get away from the glare. I mean, yeah. you put the glare up in a sunny day and yes, the ultra short throw washed out, but it was a good example to show like I, I had right in the middle of the day showing picture of the light shining straight on the screen and yes, it washed it out. It, it did a pretty good job holding its own. I mean, I got 12 foot high windows. So, I mean, it was a serious stress test and I had all the lights on, but then went over and showed, you know, with the shade shut again, I have some screen innovations, nano shades featured in that room upstairs, <laughs> shut the, the shades and did, you know, with the lights on, with the lights off and uh, compared next to a television. And I think personally, having the image washed out on a projection system still is giving better performance than that glare that you get on a know. typical TV. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, again, the other advantage we have is um, what a, a lot of people don't realize, especially a lot of your viewers, you know, we, we, we hear about 4K, 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 right? Well, resolution is a direct uh, connection to seating distance. So what I mean by that is if you have a 90-inch OLED that has 4K resolution, if you go farther than 11 feet away from that 90-inch 4K resolution, you're now watching 1080p resolution. Right? If you go another, uh, you go to 15 feet, now you're watching essentially 720p. You've lost all that fine dot pitch detail you bought the TV for in the first place. Hmm. So size is relative to distance. The average seating distance in the U.S. in the living room or the game room or the family room is about 12 feet. Well, 120 inch then is what you should be doing from 12 feet away in order hmm. to maintain the 4K resolution that you bought the system for in the first place. Right. So remember that, guys, when you're buying, you know, think about how far you're actually sitting from the actual display device in order to see the resolution you paid for. But, a lot of, but on the flip side of that, especially in the theater settings, now we can get seats closer, right? Back in the day when we had VCRs and cable boxes and 480i was a really good day, right, in resolution, <laughs> right? But we were stretching it out over such a large surface. You wanted to sit farther back so your brain filled in the gaps. Now we can put those love bags, those love seats, right up in front of the screen, right up in Right up close to the screen, the kids can go up there and divide the screen into four and play Mario Karts on 70-inch, you know, <laughs> picture, picture and picture windows, right? So it's it's about getting be able to get closer. And but again, if you want to enjoy that true resolution that 4K does for you, make sure you're getting the right size screen for your environment and then the right material to go with the right room settings.
I appreciate so you with, breaking that down for, for our customers, uh, Blake. And if you guys have further questions, of course, we offer free consultation here at Dream Media where we can help guide you on the appropriate recommendations for your room. But I wanted to ask some questions um, about seating distance and mm -hmm. um, you know specifically apply that to Shane's room. So Shane's going to be getting a 150 inch Maestro 2 and I saw in the advertisements for this it says 4k plus. So with us using an 8k e-shift phone mm -hmm. 8k projector can you break that down as to what 8K, 4K, 150 inch picture, appropriate viewing distance looks like and what you <laughs> should expect. Sure, well, the first thing to keep in mind is the reason 4K was invented was for movie theaters, not home theaters, not TVs, movie theaters. So when you guys went, everybody did it like I did this last weekend, we all went and saw Dune 2 at the movie theaters, right? Raise your hand, <laughs> right? That's like the only movie that's going to get me out of my house to watch, to go to the see the movie theater. So I went to Barton Creek here in Austin, saw it on the big Dolby cinema thing, and it was just freaking amazing, right? That's what 4K was invented for, is to get the movie theaters out of using film and to start using digital projectors, right? So imagine now we're using the same resolution for that ginormous 400-inch ginormous 400-inch diameter screen that we, you know, that we saw at the movie theaters. We're using the same resolution that we're using in home now. So you got to remember the distance thing. That 4K resolution monitor you've got on your computer monitor is a 27-inch diagonal. Because you're sitting close, right? You're right in there. And you can see the, the letters and the text and everything has a lot of detail. The farther you get back, the more of that resolution you lose, right? Well, if I got farther back and I changed that mo monitor from 4 to 8K, it didn't help me, but again, farther back didn't help, but I can get more and more close to it, okay? So where I translate that into theaters is first step in picking out a screen, right, is, you know, okay, what overall width do I have to work with? Okay, and then you have to factor in this, the positioning of the speakers because we're going to want to triangulate those speakers to the seating position. All right, now maybe you're getting a little bit too deep into the woods. The next thing you do is you take your shoebox and you divide it into thirds. Okay, you're going to want to place your seating position as close to that third, second third mark, right? Because you're, that's where your, your uh, speakers are triangulated to. And you also want to be able to see from your seating position without shifting left and right, you want to see at least 32 degrees because most humans see the 32 degree viewing cone, right? So you want to be able to see the whole screen without going, look at that monster, look at that monster, look at that monster, right? Now, when we talk about 8K resolution, guys, can you see the difference between 8K resolution and 4K resolution from the same spot in a dedicated theater where the sweet money spot would be? You kind of can, but it's in the details. You'll really notice it in the little details, like there's a there's a little hill, uh, there's a hill in the image way, way out there. And you'll notice in the 8K, you'll see smoke coming out of the chimney. In the 4K, it may just look a little foggy, right? So really, again, it all goes back to that seating position, but you have to factor in, in theater construction and building a dedicated theater, there's more than just resolution to keep in mind. It's also the speaker positioning, right? So that's why, again, acoustic transparent is so critical just placing the speakers properly in a dedicated theater because sometimes you're gonna have a nice widescreen 240 ultra wide image. And if you have a solid surface for like, like an LED wall instead of a screen, your speakers are so far out left and right, you've lost all your imaging ability, right? And then where did you put the center channel, right? So I know I've kind of rambled on a little bit, but the idea is that it's not just about the resolution and seating distance, it's also about how your speakers are positioned. And so again, I'd sit down and do the rule of thirds in designing the room. And then, then you start having the compromise conversations. Okay, well, sound wants me to be here. Picture wants me to be here. Where's the best spot? That's also a great reason to be working with somebody like you guys, right? They, so you can have that conversation because, again, like I said before, there's no silver bullet to every room. Sit down with a consultant and help them, let them help you figure that out. But bigger screens are better. I will say that. The bigger it goes, so, the more so of the to answer the question, we can use 8K projectors with this screen. Absolutely. Really, uh, when a lot it, of people sorry, ask that question. On that. Yeah, I start going down to theater design. The <laughs> reason 8K works on this woven material is because it's a condensed material. We don't have those big gaps like we did in the original Maestro. I showed you that earlier. 
it's more of a solid surface, right? If you bring the camera up close. Yeah, so if we could get an up close shot of that with yeah. the uh, picture off, I'd love to see it. How far back do you got to be from that screen to not see that texture? About three feet. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's a really tight weave. Yeah. Now, just for grins, let's go over here and look at the carbon black, which is another woven material. Again, from five feet back with carbon black before I had not see the weave, right? But you can see as you're getting close how it's a, di a different vertical channel versus the horizontal channels. And sometimes if you just hit the camera, just hits it right, you can see a little green or blue or red sparkle. That's the unicorn dandruff that is sewn into the actual carbon black weave. <laughs> now, what's the difference between that and the, uh, the regular white maestro? Well, white maestro is 1.1 gain. Carbon black is a 0.2 gain. So 80% of the light coming to carbon black is kept by carbon black. Only 20% of the light comes back. But mm. think about it, guys. It's a black surface. What does black do versus white? Black absorbs, white reflects, right? So there's not only just black material. There's actually truly is red, green, and blue. What we, we, we jokingly call it unicorn dandruff. But it's woven <laughs> into the material. So it takes a lot more gun. It takes probably three times as lumens to make this pop. But when it does because we started with black in a, in a bright room, it gives you the deepest, richest blacks you've ever seen in your life. And the contrast chart is, is, is this wide. <laughs> it is unbelievable the difference between white and black. Right. So yeah. you use that in a light control room or a light? Or uh, just... Both. Um, it's a, a pretty unique material. We can both do with acoustically transparent or not. We've seen it, we're seeing it a lot in production. So if you were to go to see Adele this weekend in Las Vegas at Caesars Palace, her entire show is carbon black. Every oh, image you see is projected. It's not LED walls. And so the advantage being is, is uh, obviously if I tear this material, I can sew it. <laughs> I don't have to replace the panel. As I mentioned to you before, we have acoustically transparent versions where when you build a wall of LEDs, I emphasize the word wall, not acoustically transparent in other words. So this is what we call an LED wall alternative. Black Diamond, Slate, ST, we call television alternatives. And it really comes down to size and what it takes to actually drive the image. So for yes. instance, like we've been looking at this projector here from Barco. Uh, Chris Deutsch, our good friend from Barco, sent this down along with Daniel. Thanks guys, we appreciate that. This is a 32,000 lumen projector. It's way overkill for the 150 that we're showing with Maestro, <laughs> yeah. but it, it looks good on camera, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? But this is the kind of projector you need. You, need, you truly need 32,000 lumens to put on carbon black in a bright, bright space. But when you do, it has a matte finish. It doesn't have that wet, shiny look that LED walls or OLED TVs or LED TVs have. So everything looks more natural. And again, I can build in one inch increments versus LED panels. I can, I can fold it up. That whole screen right there folds up into a piece like this by this, right? And I don't have to power a wall. Right, I'm just doing it with one projector versus you know powering an entire wall. So if again our, our friend Adele, me and Adele, we're super tight, right? They're they're saving millions of dollars a show just on electricity and storage and shipping and that kind of thing. Right. So what kind of projector for residential stuff was would yeah. a normal like JVC projector or Sony projector? Yeah, absolutely. Well I've got a JVC projector in the other room. I just unboxed. We're going to be bringing that into the Thunderdome to play with. Uh, obviously, I, I'm a big fan of Dayla projectors. That's JVCs because they do have the richest, deepest blacks of most of the projectors out there. Where you sacrifice, though, is in brightness. So there is yeah. a certain you know, brightness limitation to JVCs, sometimes with Sonys as well, although the Sonys have got themselves up to 10,000 lumens. Um, keep in mind, though, when you start getting to that 10,000 lumens with laser projectors, guys, and then we start talking about, you, you want to be aware, especially designers out there, guys at Dream Media, right? There is a new FDA ruling with laser projectors, and they've now classified in class one, class two, class three, in other words, they don't really want you walking into that light path, right? Yeah. They, yeah. they like they, they like our Americans to be able to see this check when you sign it for your taxes. <laughs> so they don't want us, I guess, walking into the light path. But do be aware of it's not just about brightness with laser projectors. It's also lens type. So where this projector, this little brother, is 22,000 lumens, but because of its lens type, it's only a class two, where the Sony at 10,000 lumens has a lot, for long, lot longer throw. It's a 2.2 lens to a 1.4. And that makes it a class three. So you have to make sure that that projector, for instance, is eight feet up in the air so nobody can walk into the light path. You have to give your space, you have to give yourself like four feet on either side of the screen. So again, nobody walks into the light path. So that's kind of new. 
That's also why uh, ultra short throw laser projectors are not exceeding 4,000 lumens by FDA ruling. Right? Really? And, oh. Yeah, and that's all with the new projectors, all the short throw projectors are now coming out, have those sensors. So if your dog walks up there, it'll shut off the you know, blank the screen. Yeah. Right? yeah. And guys, I've lived with the laser projector for over 10 years now. I had that, you remember that first, I had, the, I had the, literally the third prototype of the Sony and I've stuck my head in that light path. I'm going to tell you, <laughs> yeah. you'll, you'll notice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, those yeah, sensors are a lifesaver. My three-year-old is, he just loves playing yeah. on top of the ultra short throw and uh, it terrifies me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, so yeah. Blake, I, I think uh, one thing that would just be good to, to talk about um, for people who aren't familiar with some of this terminology is like, the lumens that he's talking about is the brightness output. So like the JVC well, projector. I, no, Zach, I'm sorry. Let me correct you. This is actually a, a, a pin in my side. Um, it's not lumens. It's ANSI lumens. Okay. okay. It's not lumens. It's ANSI lumens. And the reason I bring that up, my Uncle Wayne, and yeah, I live in Texas, so we all got an Uncle Wayne, right? <laughs> my Uncle Wayne calls me up. The, the Epson projector that I provided for him and on a black diamond 120, finally the lamp went out. And he wanted to upgrade to 4K and get a laser projector. So he calls me up and goes, yeah, let me send you this link on Amazon for this projector I just found. It's 800 bucks, it's 5,000 lumens, and it's a laser projector. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I look it up and sure, yeah, that's what it says from this far off in the East company that has put 5,000 lumens. Well, that's not how we measure light from a projector. We measure light coming out of the lens as an 5,000, is it 5,000 ANSI lumens? Because I really don't care how bright the bulb is inside of the projector. I care how much light is coming out of the projector. So I didn't mean to be rude to you, Zach, but I do want to press that for all of your listeners out there, when you're looking online, that just the spec you're looking for in brightness is ANSI, A-N-S-I lumens, not just lumens. If you're seeing just lumens, I would consider that a red flag on that projector company and start looking for a different company to work with. Okay? But yeah, yeah ANSI lumens is how we measure the light output of a projector. Perfect. And to take it a step further, there's an appropriate foot Lamberts that mm -hmm. our guys can help calculate yeah. for you based off of your room and the projector and screen. But I was trying to just make sure people were aware of kind of the general um, uh, specifications based off of these materials that we're talking about yeah. here. So like you had said, these, you know, really high output Sony's barcodes are going to be able to handle the carbon black. What well, this primary, the primary objective of this live stream was to talk about the Maestro too. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a couple of things that, that working with Maestro, the advantage of being in a dark room setting. Let's talk about foot Lamberts. So ANSI lumens is how we measure the light coming out of the lens of the projector, right? Well, now the light is going all the way to the screen. And once it hits the screen, it starts to bounce back. Now we're talking about foot Lamberts, right? Foot Lamberts. So if you went again with me to see Dune this weekend in the movie theaters, that screen's foot Lamberts brightness was between 12 and 22 foot Lamberts, right? Nice bright image, but really, really dark room. That's what we're going to be shooting for with most Maestro rooms. When we do the calculations, we're looking for a brightness of between 9 and 22 foot Lamberts for a dark room setting. When we turn the lights on, right, like we have here, we now have, we're looking for a foot Lamberts of between 22 and 50 foot Lamberts of brightness. But we also need to maintain contrast. So we're looking for a minimum of 30 to 1 contrast. Now, I know I'm confusing people out there. We're talking <laughs> yeah. about minimums of 30 to 1 contrast with 24 to 50 foot Lamberts. And what is the foot candles in the room? <laughs> Calm down. Everybody take a second. Breathe in. Breathe out. We have a tool on our website called the Screen Material Wizard. All it wants to know is how big a screen do you want to do and how bright the room is when foot candles, which you can download a $2 app from Apple or Amazon or, where, uh, or uh, wherever you get your apps, and it's called Light Meter. Take a light reading on your room and punch that in as 5-foot candles or 10-foot candles, and it will tell you which material is going to work properly based on... Um, uh, contrast and foot Lamberts. So we do all the math for you. You just put in the absolute basic information and it will spit out the right solution for you. Got you. Now, are, would, do you advise the customer personally, like if someone has a oh, yeah. older JVC or something like that, or, or just like a JVC in general, just one of the new JVCs to get the maximum HDR output for that? 
projector mm. in that room and all that. So in this case, Blake, we're going to be using an NZ8, right, Shane? Uh, yeah. And what? And so, what's the question? So, would would you advise on what the the correct screen is for that person's specific projector for their specific throw distance to get the most HDR in their room mm -hmm. in their space? No, that's that's, that's not really how I approach it, guys. Man. Yeah. Uh, Part of the qualifying questions I have are, first of all, how what kind of room are we talking about? Dedicated home theaters, dedicated cinemas, let's, say, let's put it that way, what we call a dark room setting only. That's kind of was a big thing, right? Because it's all we had. We only had dark rooms. We only had white screens. We only had CRT projectors and then LCD projectors. But that kind of went away over the last 10 years. We started getting into multimedia rooms or you know game rooms, uh, basement theaters, where there's a place to sit and watch the, the screen, but then there's the Peloton bicycle over here, and I got a pool table over there, and I got pinball over there, right? I got a I got a golf simulator down here too, right? Well, that's why ambient light rejecting screens became available, because you could turn the lights on or turn the lights off, versus a where a maestro room would be in a dedicated cinema. We're not only time reason we're turning the lights on is to come into the room, sit our butts down in the seats, and then turn the lights off and start the show, right? So it's where I'm going is what we the way we start the conversation is how are you going to use the screen? Are you a dedicated cinema person? Then we start having conversations about HDR. But when we're talking about multi-purpose use, we're actually looking for probably two to three to four settings depending on the lighting situation. So if it's three in the afternoon, right? I'm in my basement theater and I've got windows over here that face east or west. That's one setting. Right, that's flame flamethrower mode on the projector. I'm, I'm all my buddies are over here. We got all the lights on. I don't want to turn the lights off, right? Because I got a bunch of my boys in the room, and those aren't those aren't pillows, ah, right? <laughs> Versus, now we're watching TV. It's just me and the wife. We're watching Wheel of Fortune. The lamps are on in the room, but none of the overhead lights, right? The curtains are closed. The, the shades are down, right? That's another setting. That's a, again custom to that setup. Then I have one more setting where it's kind of like a dark room that's for like watching some TV movies, but then I have the ultimate dark, 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 everything is dark in the room. So I'm not trying to avoid the HDR question, mainly because I'm not a huge fan of the HDR taking over for what I'm trying to set up for my customers. But that's a typical setup for me is with if the ALR material is, I actually have four settings that are probably gonna be brighter than the HDR settings are gonna be. Right, got you. Right, but then, but then Zach would come in and help. Yeah, help pair up the uh, the correct screen. And the, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. This injector. is all handled by us as the integrator, Shane. So we take the same course of action, uh, looking at the situation, assessing the lifestyle of the customer, and then making recommendations. Bingo, bingo. Yeah, don't Here's get question. don't get too wrapped up in the in the terminology of like you know we want to get the best out of HDR, guys. I want to get the best out of your room. Right, that's the goal. And I've found it, like, for instance, I'm ISF certified twice, right? And I'm just going to be honest with you guys. Probably 95% of the rooms that I've set up at an ISF calibrated 6,500 degree Kelvin, that then I also set up a 7,500 degree Kelvin, 95% of those customers left it on the 7,500 degree Kelvin setting because it was warmer. It right. wasn't as dark. I'm, you know, there's, there's what the engineer says that should work or you should do, but there's also what people like, <laughs> right? Yeah. Here's a question for you, Blake. In a light-controlled room, but with light reflection off a white popcorn ceiling and lightly colored walls, and with an in-wall center speaker, is Slate AT 1.2 the correct material? Uh, yeah. First of all, get rid of the popcorn ceiling. Let's let's take care of things first. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get the scraper out and get that popcorn off the ceiling first of all. But yeah, Slate is really the Ford F one hundred and fifty Raptor of our screen materials. It does everything really, really well. It may not have to be the best of class, but it may be, it's probably second best of class. It's like second best of class when it comes to ambient light rejection, the vertical and horizontal best of class is Black Diamond. But Black Diamond maxes out at 150 diagonal and 16 by nine and cannot be micro perfed, where Slate can be micro perfed and maxes out at 220 and can be motorized. So you see where, I'm, where that conversation goes is, is it the right material for the right job? Depends on the size, depends on how we're presenting it, is it motorized, fixed, and whatnot. But in that case, yeah, Slate would be an excellent uh, uh, product for you because we're not, the, 
remember the thing about ALR materials, all ALR materials, when it comes to black diamond and slate, all optically based ALR materials, the, they have ambient light rejection is the light coming into the screen is either passed throughout the other side, right, from the opposite side, or it's rejected by the screen. Well, the same technology that keeps the light from coming into the screen, the bad light, the ambient light from coming into the screen, also keeps the light from getting off the screen. So in other words, an ALR screen material, ambient light rejecting screen material, also keeps your room darker because we're not scattering light up onto the white popcorn ceiling like a white screen or gray screen will do, right? All white screens today, all white screens today are what's called angular reflective. They're designed for a projector to be up high. The image hits the screen material and bounces down to the viewer. It used to be 26, 5, 30 years ago, screen projectors were actually mounted centered on the, on the screens, right? You used to, if you guys pull up your old cinemas, you'll see that the, the projector is actually placed in the middle of the screen. Well, now, because of angular reflectivity, we go high to bounce down to low, right? So keeping that in mind, there's also viewing cones. There's the width of the image that we need, right? Are we in a living room? Do we need to have a nice wide image so Uncle Dave way over there can see the same image that we see in the middle of the street? So that's what I mean by setting up the right material for the right room environment is viewing cones, gains, color of screen, whether or not we're using ALR or not, really does make a difference. But if you have white popcorn ceilings, definitely want to go ALR. No question about it. <laughs> it all matters, guys. Uh, you yeah. did a great job of explaining that, Blake. One other thing that I really, you know, want to give you guys props on is that black velvet wrapped frame with ultra short throw and talking a little bit about light scatter. Um, yeah. Back again, if you guys watch my video with the Epson um, ultra short throw screen, and then when I got the SI screen, my light scatter was pretty horrendous um i mean it was lighting up the walls and the ceiling was just really getting blasted like when we were watching a movie it was like lit up on the ceiling i put the si screen in and you guys got that black velvet frame and it actually absorbs a lot of that and stops the light scatter from being as yeah. as horrendous and you know what's cool is uh, there's actually a great reason for having a black velvet next to a bright surface and that's your brain's perception of contrast right if i put a meter and i have this let's go back over here to maestro if i were to take this black surface off right the frame and just have white material turn off all the lights and fire an image up there your brain would see a decent contrast the contrast would be like that right and the meter would see that but as soon as i add a black frame in this dark room, I had the black frame next to the, the bright surface. Your brain's perception of contrast becomes better, and your brain takes contrast and does this. The meter still shows this, but your brain is seeing what it thinks is way, way blacker content. And that's mainly because we added a black frame to the bright, bright, next to a bright surface. So we've talked about masking systems in the past, Zach. We were talking about, you know, the, when you go to movie theaters, how you yes, see sir. the screen, the curtains come in and out. They want to put that black frame right up against that bright movie image because they know just like i know that it's absolutely improving the way your brain sees contrast and but God, by the way guys when it comes to the most important ingredients in any video content where regardless of where it's played contrast is number one ingredient in all video images it's the sugar of video <laughs> right so when i talk about important how important contrast is believe me I'm, that's that's extremely important okay Hey, you know, you know, I had a question. Um, huh? you, I had a question. You know how you make masking screens where the uh, the mask either comes inwards from the sides or it comes downwards from the top and bottom to uh, mask out oh, the black bars? Oh, yeah. Or the pillar bars? Is there a way to go, like, like if I'm watching a 239 movie and I'd like the width to say the same, but if I'm watching an IMAX movie, can you grow the screen upwards? And outwards rather than relying on masks i'm not sure if that would work yeah but. you probably need to work with like a mad vr or a limited process we're going to take you over in our mask I you were taking us into the bathroom blake yeah i'm gonna run this dancing over here uh, you brought since you brought a mask and we thought we could bring you in here and we could show you that um there's a lot of things we can do with like a video processor so if you were going to do something like that that might be a, a mad vr solution but this is our masking dt masking system here with our slate material and again, the idea being is you're going to close in 
you see how the moving acoustically transparent material is going to bring in that black surface right up against the uh, screen material. Right? Now, a lot of the questions I get on this type of setup is when do I want to do a 235 or 240 widescreen and bring in the masking to make 16 by 9 versus we're starting with a bigger 16 by 9 screen and cropping down to 235. And I think the magic number is 150. If you can't get bigger than 150 and 235, Mm. Or the bigger 16, 16 by 9 and crop it down. Yeah. Yeah. And then this but there, but there's, no way, there's no way to reverse that, right? Like, you keep it at 239, like that size. But now I'm watching IMAX. I want that screen to get taller. I don't want to use masking. Well, in that case, then you go with the material that doesn't require masking, and that would be carbon black. Right? Now, let me fill, preface this. Remember, carbon black is black. So you can project an image on there and the surface still around it is black because carbon black's native material is black. It's almost as black as the felt, yep. right? Now you can do that, but here's the trick of doing that is not, uh, most projectors are not using 16 by nine chips. They're using 16 by 10 chips. So we're still putting uh, carbon black on a masking system because the 16 by nine image is, is there but then there's still a little bit of light spillage over the actual image. And that's because they're creating a 16 by nine image on a 16 by 10, 10 chip. Sorry to get a little in the weeds there guys, but that's why you, sometimes you see that glowing bar above or below the image of a projected image is because it's not a native 16 by nine chip. That's, that's just normal. Okay. And that's right. why we use Panamorph lenses guys Bingo. in combination with mad VR. So we're utilizing all <laughs> of the projector. We've yeah. made some deep dive videos on that. I think that could, we could take another hour down that course. <laughs> I got time. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've covered about everything with the, the maestro or the maestro, um, too. Uh, Shane, do you have any other questions? Uh, you're going to be getting the 150 16 by nine. Um, Ooh. yeah. What, what questions do you have for them? Uh, I would like to know where can a customer buy such a screen? Well, we sell direct through dealers. Uh, we, we do not sell ourselves on the web, but there are a couple web providers out there that you can purchase through, Dream Media being one of them. Um, Two-piece projection is something I strongly encourage you to have a relationship with an integrator. Whether they be on the phone, whether they be on the web, but they need to be a real live human, an HI, not an AI. Right, because again, every room has its own properties. In fact, you know, home theater 101 class, right? The first thing they tell us when we sit down in home theater 101 class is the absolute most important part of any home theater is the room. Got to start there, right? So have that first consult, right? And we're here too. I mean, we love talking to our end users, right? You can call us up. We, we'll talk to you about projectors. We'll talk to you about screens, um, because. It's two pieces, but that's just the projector and screen. Then we got to talk about the audio. We got to talk about how to, with the sources and all that come together. So I couldn't encourage you enough to have a, 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 a bud, a dude, your guy, whatever you call him, have somebody that's an integrator, you know, just at least meet with you over the phone to go over some of your options for you. Because there is a lot of choices to make. And what that HI person can do is help you make the right choices for your room. Like, for instance, we were talking about J JVC projectors. Here, I've got a JVC projector right here. You know, somebody that's not really qualifying your needs properly might just flip that over to you. And it's a great projector, but it, with a little more qualifying and understanding your needs, an, an Epson with a, with an extra thousand lumens might have been a better fit versus a JVC in, in your theater, right? So that being said, you know, again, look for a CDS certified integrator, right? C-E-D-I-A, CDS certified integrator. You can also uh, work with, uh, we're part of the Best Buy family and the Magnolias. And again, you're always welcome to call us here at Dream Media as well. And we'd love to talk to you in person and send you to some of our, our active dealers in your area. You can check out our website at screeninnovations.com and do a dealer search on your zip code. Sounds good. Zach, yeah. got anything else? All right, Zach is frozen. <laughs> Kellen, you got anything right. else? <laughs> Well, while we're here, just put uh, yeah, it around. This is the uh, last thing I'll show you, so you can just check it out. This is the new ST lift. Uh, you can see the projector down here in the case. This is an Aegis cabinet. I like just wanted to show you guys a finished system here where the screen pops up, the projector pops out. We've got the cabinet. Nothing gets above 80 degrees in this cabinet. So this is, again, one of our rollable television options, right? This whole thing pops up and pops down. 
with masking available, with ALR materials, with our traditional whites and grays, with projector performance being what it is today, I can't encourage you enough. If you're over there at Costco looking at, the, at a 110-inch TCL TV, before you pull that trigger, I would strongly encourage you to look at the performance and options that are available in two-piece projection today. Killing. Yeah. Kill, Killing's guilty of that. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it, Blake. It's always a pleasure to have you on, man. Good Thanks so you. much for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Blake. All right, nice guys. Take you. care. Bye -bye. Thanks, Blake. Guys, don't forget to uh, sign up or subscribe over to Dream Media Home Theater as well. And check out the Screen Innovations screens on their website. And uh, the guys, Zach Kellen, they'll help you pick the right screen for you. And yeah. be make sure you guys tune in. I'm going to have the screen in my home theater. I'm very excited for that. So stay tuned for the new home theater tour review of the screen as well. I'm excited for that. And hopefully, Zach, we can announce the uh who the who the speaker provider is going to be for the new theater probably another week or two i'm told from uh kenny <laughs> I'm so excited. guys very excited to be a part of the build shane thank you uh for the opportunity and i'm gonna show off some of my personal favorite brands i mean the guys down in at si in austin it hits real close to home for me so i'm very excited to show this brand some love as well as some of our other favorite manufacturers here at dream media and everybody out there, we'd love to have you come by and visit us at the uh, new Screen Innovations Experience Center. This is open for you guys to come and check out and get yourself a live demo. Nice. All right, guys. Don't forget to All like, right. share, and subscribe. Any questions, leave them down in the comment section. And, of course, links in the video's description. We'll see you in the next one. All right, Dream Media family, that is a wrap. Big thanks to Shane Lee for having us on his channel, as well as Ryan and Blake from Screen Innovations. Like I said, Screen Innovations is one of my favorite screen manufacturers. I spent about a decade of my life down in Texas and really love what this Texas-based company is doing. Not only do they manufacture amazing screens like this brand new acoustically transparent screen um, that is going to allow us to hide all of our speakers behind and give you a really nice cinematic experience but they also offer things like shades if you look right here in my room behind me i have screen innovations nano shades they have incredible uh, custom color coded options you can see the box looks really nice and clean a bunch of different options for fabrics and materials light filtering knockout so this company really has it figured out and makes amazing products that I believe in and we can stand behind here at Dream Media. If you would like to purchase Screen Innovations or anything home theater related, Dream Media offers free video consultations where we like to meet with you like this face to face and take a look at your space, walk through it, and then tailor a package specifically to your room and budget. There's so many different speakers to choose from and different applications that they fit into. Our specialists have spent decades um, recommending these products. So we know how to quickly and efficiently get you these great packages and save you money in the long run and headache. So reach out today. We also have installers. If you're not a DIY type person, we got you covered with uh, 28 different states currently. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative. If you liked it, give me a big thumbs up and be sure to smash that subscribe button down below for more. Till next time, this is Zach with Dream Media Home Theater. Thank you for watching.